hello everyone. Um, hello, Lance, uh, Daryl, Ugla. Um, great pleasure to do this uh, fireside chat with you for the next uh, 25 minutes. Uh, when I first uh, met you, the first time I met you many years ago, um, you had one little data idea that you wanted to try and change markets with. And now you're the CEO and president of a company with a market capitalization of $20 billion or more, and the ticker symbol on the New York Stock Exchange that we're all jealous of, of info. How has data changed through that, uh, through that journey? So um, thanks, Tim, and thank you uh, for having me here, Saibas. And I, I guess the um, really three things changed. Um, and, and we're talking about information in the information age. So first of all, the quantity of information has uh, increased. Uh, definitely uh, the quality of information, especially with the use of technology, has improved. And, and then finally, I'd say just the types of data. You know, we have so many new unstructured forms of data, you know, whether it's satellite imagery or, uh, you know, uh, drone photography. There's many new types of information we're dealing with. So the three big changes. And what's going to take the company forward now? So you've grown from this little operation in a barn in St. Albans and a guy with an idea to $25 billion of market capitalization. What's going to take you forward? I, I've heard you talk about advanced analytics. What are advanced analytics? And is that going to be the next $25 billion of market cap? So uh, I think with more information and more people using information for decision making, you know, we're, we're in a good place to grow. And uh, so the first thing I, I would say is uh, there's a lot of buzzwords around information, uh, you know, data science, data lakes, the cloud, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, but really a lot of it is just math. And it's, uh, it's looking for patterns and signals, uh, looking, uh, creating indices and benchmarks. And so we do a lot of that, but as data is used in uh, more interesting and clever ways, and technology keeps advancing, the advanced analytics become, uh, not that the math is changing, it's just the speed of the calculations, and therefore the resulting output is uh, changing rapidly. Now can you give us, uh, uh, um, dull economists like me from the London School of Economics, I know you went to that August institution as well, can you help um, someone like me understand, uh, give me an example of what is advanced analytics? And I, I hear that intelligence agencies all over the world use some of your products. Can you tell us about, is there anything you can tell us about the kind of products they like and how that works? Uh, sh sure, so, um, so some of the new ways that uh, advanced analytics might be uh, impacting the use of data. So um, uh, we have a new product actually, it's called Commodities at Sea. And of course, uh, so commodities. commodities at Sea. So it's taking trade data, it's taking information on commodities. Of course, what everybody wants to know is the supply-demand equation and how it impacts prices. It takes ship movements, it takes satellite imagery, measure, measuring the storage tanks, say for uh, crude oil on shore, uh, measures the size of the ships on sea and the amount of the cargo, and puts that together in a uh, indicator to indicate uh, a characteristic that could help you determine uh, prices through supply and demand. And, and so that would be a form of advanced analytics using, you know, historical structured data plus new unstructured data. And we do a lot of that. So, so when, um, when uh, security organizations around the world are worrying about where oil is going from and to, they might look to some of the tools that that uh, IHS market has to help them understand where, where cargoes have come from and where they're going to. Is that a fair assumption? That exactly right. So uh, in the case of a, um, a government using that information, it would be more prone to look at the movements of the data, probably less worried about uh, the, uh, the supply and demand characteristics of that particular uh, you know, week's uh, cargo. Um, where you may... Um, uh, use more advanced analytics, uh, you know, natural language processing is, uh, you know, the use of technology to discern information at a more rapid speed 
uh, and maybe less prone to errors than a, a human. And uh, there we may use techniques of uh, looking to analyze event risk and we create economic and country risk scores. And those are well used by companies and governments and uh, financial market participants to be able to um, you know, look at an overall risk. It might be political, might be terrorism, might be uh, uh, economic uh, within a certain region. And using NLP, we're able to, you know, go through, you know, vast amounts of information that uh, would be difficult to do with a team of people. So it's enhancing the people. Yeah. Uh, now, those of us that heard um, uh, Manoush Shafiq talking this morning, uh, heard uh, uh, talking about the, um, the, the challenges of bringing China into an integrated um, uh, global place, and she explored the challenges that the global financial system would have if we were not able to continue to integrate China. Um, uh, IHS Market is an organization that works around the world. Uh, what's your approach to engaging with and working with China? You have a PMI index, which is the most one of the most widely followed indicators of what's happening in the People's Republic of China. Is your approach to doing business and sharing intellectual property the same in China as the rest of the world, or how do you, um, how do you accommodate uh, local cultural differences? Right. Well, in some parts of the world, it's great to have a partner, and so we have a great uh, partner, uh, uh, Taishan, in, um, in, uh, in China, who we partner with to calculate the uh, Purchase and Managers Index. And so, of course, it can create conflict with government's own statistics. But in this case, uh, you know, we, we want to be independent. But at the same time, we want to respect the country and the laws of the country that we operate in. And so we are, we are careful to uh, be respectful and uh, to operate uh, in a way that's acceptable to the markets we're operating in. And, and China is a great, um, you know, a great opportunity for all companies to explore expansion in Asia. Uh, it's a huge economy. Uh, it's very much a digital economy. Uh, probably um, has a uh, use of digital technology more than any other country I've visited or spent time in. So I, I think the, um, you know, the opportunity for us to grow there and partner with local companies uh, is uh, substantive and we're doing so in three or four areas. Got it. So um, I've tried to explore the way in which the company has grown from being you and a bright idea to a big and, um, and, and global, uh, global company. Um, uh, a question that I think about when I think about SWIFT and the challenges that it faces, is it easier to um, uh, grow businesses from a blank sheet of paper when you were the uh, uh, the bond trader with a bright idea, was it easier then? Or now you've got this legacy infrastructure, data centers all over the world, capabilities. Does that give you a sort of a head start that enables you to build? Well, what's the, the best way of, of, of moving forward? What's the easiest starting right. place? Well, I think like um, many people, when you have a blank sheet of paper, uh, you have the luxury of designing everything from scratch and uh, being the architect of that. Uh, once you've uh, built your infrastructure and your home that you're living in uh, and you want to do renovations, uh, you have to consider what you already have. And uh, so in the case of uh, a big infrastructure provider like Swift or ourselves now or, or uh, any of the exchanges, uh, transforming yourself while you're in the infrastructure is uh, challenging to say the least. But you do have some benefits. You have customer knowledge. You have uh, people that are experts in what you do. Uh, you have current proprietary data sets that you might be able to leverage in new ways. So there are some competitive advantages for the, the incumbent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, we, um, uh, we can adjust, we can adapt. It means, you know, people with new thoughts and new ideas means using new technologies and, and not being afraid to cannibalize yourself and, uh, and uh, progress for change. And how have you changed? Um, we, we heard um, uh, through the day um, people talking about education and learning, lifelong learning. 
how have you changed? What, how, have you, have you, how have you invested in your skill set and your capabilities as you've built that company? Besides getting older. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess, um, well, I, I think constant learning. And I think as uh, Antonio was saying before um, on the stage, you know, investing in learning, training, education, I think that's a lifelong exercise and one that you have to embrace inside the company, embrace within yourself. And uh, I think a lot of that comes from reading. Uh, the web's a fantastic tool for us to, you know, uh, receive information, uh, read, learn, develop. And so I, I think constant education is important. Also bringing new blood into the company, you know, the youth and uh, uh, new ways of thinking about things that uh, might be different than how you might have thought about them before. So it is uh, change, but change with an educated view. And you're talking about bringing new um, views and perspectives into a company. Um, you've, uh, you've been known for doing lots of acquisitions, uh, dozens of acquisitions. How have you, um, what steps have you taken to maintain or develop or evolve a particular culture that works for the whole firm? Or to what extent have you been content to tolerate different approaches and different cultures in the different firms that you've, uh, that you've acquired over the years? Well, I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to acquire a company and then remove its, uh, you know, its DNA, the thing that you, you acquired it for. And uh, so to me, what I'm more interested in is being able to uh, bring cultures together uh, within a, uh, a structure of values that we all share. And therefore, you can be different, but we need to share the values of the company. And those values are things that, uh, you know, most, uh, you know, all the acquisitions that we ever made would have shared at the outset. So that part's uh, easy. But when you try to take away a brand, you try to take away uh, the culture, you try to, you know, disarm the company that you fell in love with and acquired, uh, the result is usually a negative one. Mm. So we try to avoid that. Got it. So you, you, um, you've developed quite a high profile on social media. And you've talked about some of the issues that Antonio was talking about earlier on, about people, about mental health issues. You talked about, about gender. Uh, why do you do that? Is it working for people um, in the audience. So you, are you pleased you're doing that? Is that something you feel you ought to, but it's damn hard work, or forgive me, is it hard work, or, or where does that come from? Well, I do, I have to say I find, um, you know, I'm a, a reluctant uh, user of social media because I, I, um, it does take a lot of work to try to uh, maintain and build a profile around the key issues you care about. And of course, as an information company, uh, you know, it's important to our brand to uh, build our stories around uh, the insights, the data science, the information that we, world that we participate in. So that part I find quite enjoyable. And, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, I'll spend some time. If I read something, uh, I may, um, uh, participate in commenting and providing a comment uh, externally. Um, and then there's also issues around people that I really care about. And so learning is something that, uh, you know, I, I was impressed. I, I wanted to go back and see how, how much our learning has increased after seeing Antonio's 4.4 million, you know, hours of training. I thought, wow, that's a big number. You know, we have 15,000 people, not as many as Lloyds Bank, but we're really investing in, in learning. And our, you know, how are our numbers uh, and metrics looking? Um, I also care a lot about um, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see it as a challenge to you know, today's companies, families, communities. It just seems to be every time I turn a corner uh, in the company, uh, in my personal life, in the communities, that I live in, I'm confronted uh, with some form of mental illness or anxiety that's impacting somebody that matters to me. So uh, 
you know, recently I did uh, provide a comment around stress and stress-related uh, um, anxiety. And, and I think it's important uh, that we all speak up a little bit more. The world's accepting. You can, you can say a lot more today than you could 10 years ago, yeah. 50 years ago, 100 years ago. It's less embarrassing. It's, it's less difficult. So I think as a, a leader of a uh, reasonable sized firm, I shouldn't be afraid to speak up. Father of four children, lots of friends and family. And uh, so to me, I, I want to speak up about those issues. Good stuff. Um, so you, 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 at the heart of, of, of market is still data. Data is still a key driver of, uh, of the business. We've explored some of the ways in which you're moving into to other areas now. Um, do you um, have uh, significant uh, personal data sets? We've talked about commercial data sets. So do you have a significant amount of personal information? And whether you do or you don't, what are your thoughts on the very um, pertinent and very relevant to everybody here conversation about the way personal data is treated? There are some other companies that, whose, whose market value is built on ownership of people's data. Do you think we've got that right? Do, we think, do you think we need regulation in, the, in that space? Or can we carry on as we are? Well, I think Europe with GDPR has taken a lead and um, you know, setting some guidelines that will give people some comfort uh, that their personal data won't be misused. But I, I think in general, when you meet people today, uh, I think we all feel that our data is just escaping into this uh, World Wide Web, into places that um, we may or may not want it to be. And therefore, I think in the future, uh, I can envision having my own data vault that I open up to the external world when I'd like to. I can expunge it from the external world if I, I want to, and I can participate in, in, a, in a data exchange uh, that may help society, may help me personally, uh, may add value to something that I'm engaged with. But I, I do think that there's a, a, a quite um, extensive uh, forward curve of development with respect to personal data. And I, I think Europe uh, definitely has uh, put itself out in front in this uh, regulatory uh, discussion and is making some you know, I, I think what are good, good moves, even though they're difficult to implement and expensive. Yeah. Now, with my background in the credit market, I saw um, uh, your company bring uh, transparency to markets which historically had not been transparent. Um, and a competitive advantage that some bank institutions had was surrendered for the market good of everyone kind of knowing where uh, a price is. Uh, that's a market that you and I know well. Um, we're here at Cybos. Um, have you thought about the payments industry and the transparency in the payments industry? Uh, do you think that there's enough? Do you think we need more? Can you see a transformation there, like the transformation that your company helped bring about in the, in the credit market? Well, okay, they're quite different markets, as you know, and the credit default swap market, you can actually, you know, put a box around it, and it's uh, quite manageable, uh, regardless of uh, the transparency, uh, by allowing uh, data to be exchanged in new ways amongst market participants. I think if you looked over that time, the largest market participants uh, um, also uh, gained an advantage by being able to uh, grow the market they were in uh, to a larger size and then participate even if the uh, margins and transparency uh, changed. I think uh, payments, and we're not in payments, but I have looked at it, it's a, a very interesting uh, opaque market. You know, we receive a payment and it's got an IBAN code. It might not have the name. Uh, there's all sorts of challenges around KYC. Um, I'm never sure of what my FX fee was. I don't know what my 
uh, transfer fee was or if there was any banking fees. Sometimes I send money to somebody and they say, you, you left $50 off. And I go, how did I do that? Uh, so I think uh, payments is an interesting uh, area. And I just joined, actually, the MasterCard board. So I'm being immersed into the, uh, the competitive world of uh, payments. And, and I think it's a very interesting one, and one that will also, uh, over the, uh, the coming years, face uh, interesting uh, change and new forms of transparency will be added into that marketplace. Got it. Um, uh, the first thing this morning, we heard, we heard uh, Yawar and, and Javier, uh, Chairman and, and CEO of SWIFT, talking about um, competition and cooperation. Uh, as you think about the way you built your business, you got a, a group of banks that competed fiercely with each other, including the one that I worked at at the time, and you got them to cooperate. Um, there are often regulatory challenges around doing that, of getting competitors to work together to cooperate. Well, what's the, what's your, what's the, the, the Oogler recipe for when to compete and when to cooperate? Well, I generally think that uh, where you can have market participants, leading market participants, uh, coming together to create solutions to make markets more efficient, uh, to grow marketplaces, to make them uh, transparent, to bring down fees, to share in costs of infrastructure. I think that's a good thing. I think that what the market showed us is that um, you need to be very thoughtful and careful on how you're going to uh, bring, bring a marketplace together. And I, I think the regulatory environment post-2008 is a much different one than before 08, and a much different one before 01, and a much different one before 87. So if you go back to all the big financial shocks and events, markets have uh, developed and changed in ways that uh, are, are mostly good for uh, you know, the world we, we live and operate in. Uh, but I would say that um, as we look forward into the future, we're gonna see that where institutions can come together to help provide some utility uh, for the world, then uh, these things um, uh, should be discussed. They should be managed in a safe environment, one where um, uh, you know, there isn't uh, any unfair practices. And uh, if we can create products through uh, cooperating and working as partners, I, I think the end result is better. Lance, we're nearly at the end of our allotted uh, time. You're still clearly enjoying yourself after all these years. You're still smiling away here. What motivates you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Why are you still doing it? Well, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I probably I came from a family that all worked into their uh, 70s and 80s. And, uh, they've uh, they, They've lived a long time. So when I look at uh, grandparents and parents, uh, uh, working was part of living, and uh, as long as you're enjoying it, you're having fun, you're able to add value, uh, it's something that uh, I'll keep doing, and, uh, and I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now, so we'll continue with that, uh, that uh, forward curve. Great. Well, Lance, thanks very much for sharing your thoughts with us. I hope our audience have enjoyed that as much as I have, and very best wishes. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, Lance Ugler. Thank you.